Hey there, thank you for tuning into Duck Bricks, and welcome to another episode of Bionicle Fan and Reviews, where I review every single fan created, canonized Bionicle model. These are not official LEGO sets, but instead these are fan created models officially accepted into the Bionicle Generation 1 storyline, either via original LEGO sponsored contests like the Dark Hunter and Rahi contest in 05, or through the more modern TTV canonization contest currently being overseen by Greg Farshti. Today's subject matter is Devastator. So Devastator was built for the 2005 Dark Hunter contest, and his brief backstory is that he originated from a crevice on the realm of Karzani. Nobody knows what he is, where he came from, but he's incredibly powerful. He's one of the most fearsome Dark Hunters out there. And actually what's kind of interesting about this is that Devastator did not appear in the Dark Hunter book. For whatever reason, he only appeared in a magazine, the LEGO Club magazine in 06. And in that magazine, there was a list of pretty incredulous powers. Some powers I'm not really sure if I believe. They said that Devastator claims that he can do all sorts of things, including raise the dead and whatnot. Now, knowing the Bionicle universe, that's probably not possible unless he has some sort of a link to the Red Star. But he tends to overhype himself, overhype his powers. But maybe he really isn't one to mess with because you can see just how tall and imposing this guy is. Because of the fact that Devastator appeared in the magazine and not the Dark Hunter guidebook, we don't actually know too too much about him, and especially we don't know if any of the powers that he listed are actually true or not, or he was just embellishing his own skills. Regardless, this is a very imposing model, and to get started I'll be reviewing all of these models on four key points. Number one is posability. So can I get this into cool poses? Can he move around? Can he hold the weight of his own weapon if he's holding one? Number two is building techniques. So does this just recycle stuff from the sets or does it actually try something new? Number three is overall aesthetics. So how good does this look in general? And number four is how does it make sense in the story? So does this scale well next to other Bionicle characters? Does it make sense in the way that it's built that it could be existing in the universe? And does it make sense in correspondence with its backstory? Although I will say for this particular model, he doesn't really have that much of a backstory, so we'll probably just be sticking to comparisons in terms of how well does he look compared to other models. But so without further ado, I think it's time to just dive in and take a look at Devastator, the Dark Hunter. All right, so here we have Devastator the Dark Hunter. This is a very special model because, again, he did not appear in the original Dark Hunter guidebook, but instead was only featured in a Club Magazine turnaround one year later, which is pretty interesting, I will say. The other thing you may notice about him is that he is considerably larger than many other beings that we've reviewed for this. And unfortunately, you may also notice that I'm already having some trouble making him stand up for the review. Despite having double jointed legs, they don't really do too too much for him, just because they just simply aren't enough to support the sheer weight and size of this model, but we're going to get to that. In the meantime though, let's just do a bit of a spin around, turn around for this model, again this one is another one that will not fit on my 360 degree turnaround stand so I have to kind of do this manually and it's also a little bit awkward I will say just because of the sheer size of this model. But let's just start off immediately with posability on this creature. Now posability wise it seems like it would have the standard amount of articulation but there's a few kind of strange things going on. I think honestly the easiest place to start are the arms which are the most simple out of all of them. Now your joints may vary on this one, so you'll notice that this one is really flopping around. The other arm, which is basically identical, is a little bit better. So again, your mileage will vary when using these older style of friction joints. Personally, I have had very, very bad luck with the older style of joint here, and I've had it so bad that they actually tend to reduce friction rather than give it friction because the rubber band has deteriorated or the rubber molding of the part. That being said, I've had many people comment and say that they've had the same thing. I've also had many people comment and say they had the exact opposite, and these pieces are doing just fine for them. So I really do feel like it depends on which pieces you get. So going back to the arm articulation, you'll notice it basically has a pretty standard amount for the arm here. The hand is, I'm going to say a little awkward. This entire mass is the hand, and that's probably the weakest part of the build. We'll get to this when we talk about building techniques and aesthetics, but I mean, for posability, it's fine. You can see that it's generally just restricted to this kind of 90 degree angle here. 
but that's not too too bad because it is just an extension of the hand and the rest of the arm can generally be moved around. I do want to note one thing though, it is impossible to keep the arm up at this angle. That's because you're kind of getting tricked by the way this is articulating. You see, rotating this all the way around and showing you the arm from this side, you'll notice that this Hordika neck attachment piece is only adhered to the Throbot's torso here by one single Technic pin. Which means that yes, you get some articulation by it moving up and down like you can see right here, but that's kind of fake articulation because it doesn't actually stay like that. And the fact that they use this type of joint really doesn't help it all that much. Sure, you can try to forcibly push this piece down and then bend just the limb segment up and then you can kind of get it to stay up, but then again, you're going to have it collapsing due to weight and even if you don't do that when you're normally moving it around, the Technic pin is just going to rotate instead, essentially neutering any arm articulation unless you really are careful about it and forcibly push this piece downwards. I'm not really sure why they did not mount this on two different pins here. Obviously it would have lowered the arm a little bit, but I feel like that would have been an okay compromise because right now it's kind of just sitting there at an awkward angle and the amount of flex there is between the pin here really isn't that great. That being said, it, there is kind of an easy fix for this. If you really wanted to, just flip this gray piece upside down and attach the other open Technic axle acceptor there onto the actual Technic axle that's in its place and voila, you'll have an arm that doesn't do this. But then moving on from the arms, we can take a look at the head articulation. Now this is pretty standard, just, I mean, you can really just move it around like a normal head. And there is one thing you may notice as I move this around. There are ball joints on the back of the head, but don't get confused. These don't actually do anything in terms of articulation. These ball joints here are actually just there for added detail. Which is, I will say, something I do like about the head. It actually integrates these ball joint pieces or these Rahaga limbs here in a way such that it adds texture to even the back of the head. This really wasn't needed, but is a nice touch. But we'll get into more of that when we get into building techniques and aesthetics. Who oh boy, but now it is time to focus on the legs. I'm gonna raise this guy up a little bit because again, this is really massive, barely even fits within the realm of my camera here, but you can just immediately see that the legs at first glance seem to be pretty well armored up and pretty well frictioned up as well. You've got two different ball joints attaching onto the upper leg here. And for the knee, you also have multiple different ball joints being attached here. Let me just showcase how this bends like this. You've got one ball joint here and you've got this other ball joint here, which I guess is for added friction. And then for the foot, you just have a standard amount of ball joints do ignore that sticker on his foot there. Uh, that is not supposed to be there, it's from an XO4 set. Somehow I ran out of gray feet. I don't know how that even happened, but I guess a lot of models use them and I just had to use one that I had on hand which did have a sticker on it, but just ignore it. The sticker isn't supposed to be there, obviously, but I didn't want to take it off for just this review. But let me just get back to the posability of the legs. The more that you actually fiddle around with it, the more that you may realize that these are actually a lot less stable than they may appear. And the reason for that is because the specific placement of the additional ball joints really don't do too, too much in terms of friction. As you can see here, a lot of times for larger Bionicle Titan size builds, they tend to take advantage by multiple ball joints by including them in a position where you're not just having the added benefit of two different ball joints having friction, you're also having the added benefit of having multiple other ball joints and Technic pins also adding more friction. However, the way that this is mounted means that it's more of kind of just a dual connector rather than an actual friction adder. If you try to bend it forwards, you can immediately see the legs starting to split apart, which really isn't that great. As you can see here, bending the leg back causes it to split apart and it even separated this from the ball joint itself. So it's kind of an awkward connection. And what it does is that it forces the legs to either just be rod straight, because as soon as you move them back and forth, they start to separate out, or you kind of have to splay them out perpetually, which neither of which is a really great way to do things. The other thing is that as we go on to the lower leg here, and I'm just going to raise this up again so you can really see this lower leg. Honestly, the building techniques here feel a little bit awkward to me. It almost feels like they just had to throw in another ball joint because it wasn't staying up 
and the builder just wasn't quite sure exactly how to mount this joint. As such, when you bend it, it doesn't really look like a knee and it more looks like, well, a blob of parts that's maybe in some semblance of a leg. I also am not a big, big fan of the way this silver Metru foot is mounted. It's mounted at such a severe angle that it doesn't really do anything to cover up this very gappy location, but instead it just feels like an awkward bit that's kind of sticking out of the side. The feet, however, are very simple. They're literally just layered different feet. You can see right here the foot is just comprised of three different Mata feet and one Borok foot here, just kind of in a very simple positioning. Honestly, the feet are fine. I'm perfectly okay with the feet. They're relatively traditional, but they do the job. This lower leg though, very, very awkward. The upper leg is a little bit better, just at least in terms of armoring, because at least you can see that once I actually reconnect this, which again has split apart due to the movement, they actually did put in some effort to add some additional armor pieces along the upper leg. I actually really do like the way that this gear is used in conjunction with the Korok Call Shield in order to actually look like it's part of one continuous segment of armor. Of course, this shield piece here actually has these kind of gear-like saw elements to it, and then you've got an actual gear right here, so I really actually do like the way that these parts have some sort of synergy with each other and really do feel like they work together. The upper leg is also a lot more traditionally shaped if you kind of ignore the awkward way that these beams are positioned and you just look at the upper leg as a whole as one block, this looks a lot more realistically like a leg than the lower leg which honestly kind of makes everything fall apart. So the upper leg is definitely better than the lower segment of the leg, the feet are fine, but in terms of friction and in terms of posability, you can't really do too too much other than having him just continuously fall over because, let's face it, this is not one of the more stable models. I will say though, we've encountered far far worse before <coughs> Gladiator, but this is not really that great either and you can see I'm already having a lot of trouble standing this guy up on a platform that I've actually artificially made a lot more friction to have on it. But now that we've covered articulation, which is a bit of a hit or miss to me, nothing really great about the articulation and posability here, I will have to say when we move on to building techniques, I'm a lot more positive on quite a few different aspects of this model, and a lot more positive when it comes to aesthetics, which we'll get to. I really do like the usage of different armor pieces going upwards on the torso, which really gives it this angular look and feel. The Onua Claws in silver act perfectly as a ribcage, that's really really cool to me. And I actually love the usage of the Toa Nuva armor, which acts as kind of a pelvis plate here, and the angles actually work out perfectly well with the way these claws are mounted at an angle. Additionally, the use of these Throbot rib cages and body pieces here, in conjunction with the triangular shaped Matoran body, really make it feel like this is one solid torso. In fact, the torso construction is probably my favorite part of the entire build. It looks really good on the outset, it comes together very well, there's nothing that's very particularly fragile about it or unstable, unlike some of the other parts, and generally it looks like a lot of the work went into making this torso really great, which is something I do appreciate because it does look the part. I really appreciate the use of these feet pieces here as additional armor padding on the front. Again, that rib cage looks suitably menacing and unique. And even as we move on to the back, yes, these are supposed to be black instead of dark blue. My apologies, but not a huge, huge deal. Moving on to the back, I do actually really like the usage of the Rakshi spines on the back here. They're almost like showing the muscles on the back of this character in a very particular angled way. I only do wish that they actually were able to utilize these ball joints for something else. Maybe if they were mounted a little bit lower, they could have actually been used to help with the leg articulation and had some sort of other thing attaching from the back of the leg all the way up to this ball joint. One can dream that that would be something that would be pretty nice, but in general, even without using these ball joints here, which are unfortunately open, even the back of this build, which isn't supposed to be viewed from the back, does look pretty solid and well put together. It's not like it completely falls apart from the back because they've actually added some sort of armor plating on the back, this unique piece usage here that really isn't seen anywhere else in the build. So it's quite a good way of armoring up the back here. 
And as we go up towards these shoulders, I actually do really like, if you look at it even from the top, it looks like these shoulder pads are very massive and very menacing, and they really do fit with the rest of the model. Using the golly hook piece in silver to form the curves of the shoulder pads really actually make it feel fleshed out, and I do actually like the usage of this tube here, the Technic Flex Tube, to add some more bulk to the shoulder pads. All in all, I think I can say that building technique-wise, at least where the torso is concerned, I am a big, big fan. I only wish that this torso could have been used for a model that was a lot more well-built for, say, the arms or the legs, because while the arms and legs are pretty weak and the head's just alright, the torso is really, really fantastic in my opinion. But speaking of the head, that's the one thing we haven't really talked about in terms of building techniques and aesthetics, it's a bit of a mixed bag for me, specifically because, as I mentioned before, some of the building techniques are pretty nice. I like the usage of the smaller Rahaga limbs as back head detailing. I do also like the usage of this flex tube here to go around the top of the head, although I do kind of wish there was more flex tubes, maybe if they had one, and two here, that would have come across as something a little bit cooler. And the placement of the black Onua claw here feels a little bit awkward to me. I'm not really sure what that's supposed to be. Is that supposed to be a massive jaw with like an overbite? Is that just supposed to be kind of a visor that he's looking through, shape of his helmet maybe? My mind is having some trouble parsing what exactly this is supposed to represent. So that's kind of why I'm not the biggest fan of it. In addition, the Borok teeth, which are mounted at different angles, also feel a little bit strange to me in the way that they're mounted. I almost expect these to be maybe part of a jaw, but then there's no upper jaw. These are mounted on the side, so they're more like tusks or even ears. Not really sure what exactly I'm supposed to be looking at for the face here, and I'm not necessarily saying that having a completely alien look and feel is something bad. Of course, they've pulled that off many times before. It just feels to me that I'm having a little bit of trouble parsing where exactly his mouth is and what exactly I'm supposed to be looking at for the face here other than the eyes, which are very clear. That being said though, moving on to the arms, they're again a bit of a mixed bag for the arms. I am actually a fan of the way that they used a alternating build here for spikes. They used a minifigure katana piece and then they used a traditional bar length minifigure uh, sensei wu staff type piece for the top here, which gives it a semblance of two different types of spikes sticking out of his arm. When looking at the official pictures, I wasn't actually sure if I would like this because this is very much like a spike and this is very much just a rounded bar with no spiky part to it, but I actually do appreciate that these feel a little bit different and the thickness definitely feels like a bit of a gradient. You're going from something very thin in terms of the minifigure katana here and then going to something a lot thicker with this rounded rod here. That being said, it does feel a little bit flimsy, especially compared to just how bulky the rest of the body is. I kind of would have liked it if they just had a little bit more bulk to the arms, but then again, that would make it droop down way more than it already has. For the lower arm, well, it's literally just a Rakshi limb piece with a Pohatu Nuva climbing claw attached. Not really any ingenuity there in terms of coming up with new building techniques, almost just feels like they kind of ran out of parts last minute or just wanted to throw together a lower arm very quickly after spending a lot of time on the torso. And then the hand. The hand is probably the strangest and worst part of the build to me. You see, this doesn't wield any weapons at all, so it's not even that you could kind of excuse it by saying, oh, it's meant to go around a weapon or something like that. No, this is just, um, hmm, okay, well, let me just describe this hand. It's basically just using a Toa Metru leg piece, or upper leg piece. They've got a claw at the top here, another Borok eye here, which acts as a claw, and then it just has this inexplicable socket at the end. I almost feel like this socket was supposed to attach to a weapon that maybe was attached via ball joint, and then maybe the builder ran out of time and didn't get to finish it and just called it good because it feels so strange to me how the rest of the build is very sophisticated. You've got a fantastic torso, pretty good head, at least some interesting building techniques going on in the legs, and then you have these hands which quite frankly feel a little bit amateurish. I really just don't know what is going on with these hands here because again, with this claw, 
I understand having a claw piece, it's not a bad claw piece, but then this piece of the Metru leg piece just sticks so far out of the claw, I don't know if I'm supposed to interpret the socket as another part of the clawed hand, almost like a minifigure hand, and you've got this other claw on the side, not really sure what I'm supposed to be looking at here, and for someone who's a tremendous fighter, I can imagine this guy fighting with his bare hands, these barely even look like hands to me. In fact, if this, if you told me that this segment right here was one of his limb segments, like if you used that as the limb segment and then you had just another hand on the tip, I would have believed it because this does not look like a hand to me. It really just looks like some random combinations of Technic pieces and armor slapped on. So that's easily the weakest part of the build here. So that about covers some of the building techniques for the upper part of the body, and I also covered some of the aesthetics too. Now it's time to talk about the aesthetics and building techniques for the lower part of the body. I touched on this while talking about the legs earlier, but I do actually like how the upper legs look. They look pretty realistic and meaty to me. Lower legs, again, very gappy, very strange angles of pieces that somehow just don't feel quite right. I also feel that this particular segment here with the knee feels almost under-armored. You've got this whole Technic beam sticking way past out where it should, in my opinion. Probably should have shortened this beam a little bit because this just kind of sticks out awkwardly. I would have really liked it if they put some sort of an armor piece just covering up this knee pad here to make it just look a little bit more cohesive because as it is right now, the lower legs are just a little bit awkward. This position right here where I'm raising him above the camera just showing the legs is probably the nicest looking position you're going to get the legs in because here you can actually kind of see them as legs if you don't look too too close in the details. As soon as you try to bend it though or get it into different positions, it kind of looks a little bit awkward. The lower legs just don't look quite right to me. Kind of hard to explain exactly why other than they're just very gappy, these pieces are angled very strangely, and there's overall just kind of weird usage of pieces, which is very apparent when you go to the back and you kind of lose all these armor pieces that were covering up some of the pieces on the front. Now looking at the back, you've just got all this exposed Technic axles, Technic pins, just beams scattered throughout, a Rakshi torso for some reason, not really sure if that piece was really needed to be used there, so Overall, the lower half of the legs feel a little bit awkward to me, and even here highlights the weakness of the upper half of the legs, which as you can see here are just a series of Technic beams that have kind of been armored up, but not armored up too too well. So the legs are also relatively weak, although they do actually do some nice things in terms of aesthetics, like I said, using the combination of these pieces here was a neat technique. So. Definitely better than the arms and hands, but really not that much closer because, again, it really does feel like a lot of the effort for this model went into building that admittedly fantastic torso. But with that, we've about summed up the building techniques, posability, and aesthetics of this model. Let's take a step back now and review this against some other representative samples in the Bionicle universe. Specifically, I'll be bringing over some other Dark Hunters, as well as Karzani, who is the ruler of the realm he allegedly originates from. Let's take a look. Alright, so here we have the Dark Hunter Devastator surrounded by some of his fellow Dark Hunters. I've just pulled over two representative samples. One of them is Darkness, who kind of shares a similar color scheme, and one of them is Tyrant, who shares a very different color scheme, but is approximately the same height as a standard Toa size or a Nika size build. I've also brought over Karzani, who again is the ruler of, well, Karzani the island, which is supposedly where Devastator comes from. So just to look at some size comparisons in universe, again, this is a very, very tall model, a very formidable character for sure, and he definitely does scale generally okay next to some of even the other taller Dark Hunters. Darkness is of relatively average size, and he does actually scale highly above him, even with the claws extended, so it's a little bit too large to be believable, but I can kind of see it. We don't know what race this character is. We don't know exactly what his backstory is even because pretty much everything that's written in the club magazine was added with an extra addendum that they're all stories that have been told by him himself. So you don't know if he's telling the truth when he says he came from Karzani or he can do all the things he says he does. All we know is that this is what he looks like in universe and he is definitely a formidable warrior. 
There are some taller Bionicle characters and some taller Dark Hunters, but he is one of the tallest, but the height doesn't throw me off too, too much because, again, he's definitely not way taller than everyone that it's unbelievable. He can still scale, and if any of these characters were to get into a fight, I could see people reasonably being able to combat each other. That being said, though, I do think he's a little large next to Tyrant here, who's about the size of a Toa. I don't know if this guy's, like, double the size of the Toa, but... Then again, some artistic interpretation is needed, and in terms of the other stuff, like how this is built, it generally is built quite well, especially again around the torso, using these Bionicle pieces in synergy with each other to keep it well grounded in the universe, while still doing its own thing. In terms of whether or not Karzani could have created this guy, or even modified this guy off of a Matoran, well, anything's possible in that crazy mind, so you know what, maybe. But setting aside some of these representative samples, it's time to instead just take a look at the rest of the points of this model and try to summarize exactly how I feel about this Dark Hunter in general. So with the believability in-universe, which is what we just talked about, I'm going to give this one an 8 out of 10. I think that it's kind of hurt by us not knowing anything about his backstory. We don't know if anything he said is even true. The height is a little bit stretching it, just a tad. Feels a little bit unbelievable next to some of the other characters, but I can still see this in-universe, and it's definitely helped by the fact that it uses a ton of different Bionicle pieces in its construction. For the next point, though, we're going to have to be going a little bit more in detail for the next three ones. For posability. Now, posability is the one where I think it's definitely going to get the lowest score, because again, if you look at this, it's just kind of hard, well, to keep it standing up straight. It takes a good deal of effort to even just get this guy in a standing pose, and if you try to bend the legs around too much, you can do what I just did, and just have the socket just pop right out because they're just not optimized to work together in the ways that they're laid out. It's really not a model that's easy to pose, and it's definitely not helped by the fact that it's kind of hard to move around the arms just by the way that it's mounted. Really, the only thing that is easy to pose is, well, the head, because that is mounted on just one ball joint, and it's not super, super heavy, and it's not even blocked by any other pieces here, so you can still get a pretty wide range of motion on the head. Actually, a very wide range of motion. For the legs, though, while you can pose it, it's not really that you cannot bend the leg. I mean, you can bend the leg like this just fine. You can't really get it into standing poses too, too well. Because of the height, it just can't support its own weight, and then again, if you try to bend the front leg forward and backward, as you would want to do in a running or walking pose, the more you bend it back, the more these pieces, you can just hear it, start splitting apart. So, really not a great construction for the legs, I will have to say. Not even a great construction for the arms, which is kind of disappointing to me. Again, I'm getting a little frustrated with the slew of Dark Hunter models, the canonized models, that simply cannot support the weight of their own bodies, especially it's such a shame when the torso is built so well too. I'm a big fan of the way this torso is shaped, and this guy just keeps on falling over non-stop. So it's really kind of unfortunate there. Posability. I'm going to give this one a 4 out of 10. I've given worse scores, definitely given better, but it's really not great when you can't stand it up, you can't even bend the legs forward and back without them splitting apart, and the attempts that have been made to increase the amount of friction with ball joints kind of fall flat. These other ball joints here don't really do anything, so really not a big, big fan of this. And again, even with the arms, how little the arms are. He's not even holding a weapon, mind you. No weapon. Still, the arms tend to droop down because of the way they're constructed. So that's a big miss for me, going to be a big hit on the posability. And then moving on to building techniques, this one is a little bit more of a mixed bag because you have the added benefit of this torso, in my opinion, being quite spectacular. I am a big fan of the way the different pieces come together on this torso to have a continuous shape while actually using these armor pieces which were intended for much smaller characters. Using this Nuva armor here, sloping upwards, the excellent technique of a ribcage here, that's not something you see in Bionicle models every day, and even the way that these shoulder pads are formed really gives this an imposing feel to him, really feels like a solid torso, nothing's flimsy, nothing's falling apart when you wiggle the torso around, it's just one very solid construction. 
Then you get to the legs, and aesthetics-wise, the upper legs aren't too, too bad. When you try to move them, they're just going to split apart, but aesthetically, this, I can give it a bit of a pass. I like how this gear piece interacts with the actual gear piece here, and it feels like these have some sort of a synergy. So, upper leg, not too bad. Lower leg, though. That's where things really start to fall apart. No idea why this is at such a severe angle. I don't know why this whole Metru foot piece here is just sticking so far out to the side. It just feels very awkward to me as a construction. Not a big fan of the lower leg at all, and even the knee. That's where things start to go awry with this very exposed Technic beam, completely unarmored and really just feeding into a very disappointing lower leg. The arms, while I did say I don't really mind the technique used for the upper arm, in fact, I think it's kind of neat how they try to vary things up and spice it up a little bit by using different sizes of bars and swords. The hands, again, I don't know what was going on with the building techniques for the hands. Even the lower arm is just a really, really standard piece here. So kind of just an awkward construction overall. And the head is also just a hit or miss to me. Some parts I do like, like the use of these smaller limb pieces as backing detail, and other parts are a little bit hard to parse mentally, like the placement of the Borok teeth here and the placement of the Onua claw. All in all, I'm going to give building techniques a 6 out of 10. That's only because of the torso. The torso saved this model for me. If it wasn't for the torso, the score would be much, much lower because of the awkward lower legs, the almost non-existent upper arms and hands, and the kind of awkward head as well. The torso being as good as it is kind of saves it in terms of points. So again, 6 out of 10 for that. Perfectly happy with that score. And then we can go on to aesthetics. So aesthetics is again a bit of a mixed bag because I feel like this is heavily reliant on what I was saying before with the torso looking spectacular and the rest of it looking, well, less than spectacular. Again, this torso, really great, ribcage good. I don't know how many times I need to say it, but the torso is great. I don't understand what's going on with the hands whatsoever. The hands are very, very awkward to me, really don't go right. The lower leg is also very gappy and full of holes. The upper leg is, well, it's all right, I think. For being built around this time period, the upper leg is not too, too bad, but again, there's just some sort of awkward stuff going on. I think I'm going to have to give aesthetics a split perfectly in the middle, five out of 10, because honestly, I like about half of this model. I am generally okay with the pieces used for the upper arms. I like the variety in bars for the upper arms. I'm generally fine with the upper legs. I like the use of the gear alongside the Korok Call Shield piece, and I actually do like how solid they feel as upper legs. I really like the torso. I think the torso is well done and aesthetically looks very menacing. The head could use some work in my opinion. I think the head kind of could have been refined a little bit more to give it a more defined mouth and teeth, and then the lower legs, I do not like at all. Same for the lower arms, which I don't really like at all either because the hands are just very awkward to me. All in all, I think that this is the perfect model deserving of a 5 out of 10 score because I like a lot of aspects of it and I don't like a lot of other aspects. Honestly, if it were up to me and if I were recommending for someone to try to reimagine this character, I would say keep the torso. Maybe keep some of the techniques for the arms, and you probably want to, will want to redo most of the rest. Maybe you can kind of go off of this template for the lower legs, but add some more knee padding and kind of clad it up a little bit around the lower leg especially. But with that, I think we've about summed up all four key points of this model. Definitely more of a mixed bag than I was expecting. Honestly, this looked fantastic in the LEGO Club depiction. I was really excited to build this. And personally, I am very happy that I have the chance to own this because again, there's a lot of stuff about this that I do like, about the torso, the upper legs, the upper arms and whatnot. But again, there was a lot of stuff here that I was honestly kind of let down by. I wasn't expecting it to be this, this flimsy, especially when I saw the numerous different ball joints. In fact, when I first saw these lower legs, I at first was kind of happy that I was like, okay, well clearly they sacrificed aesthetics to actually make it be able to pose, but I was wrong because no, they just sacrificed aesthetics to try to make it be able to pose well, but not really succeed. So really definitely a surprise to me in some parts, was happy with the way the torso was built, and all in all, this is a pretty okay Dark Hunter. 
Not one of the best, not one of the worst, just okay, but a lot of potential for improvement if you take this excellent torso concept and expand it outwards. But I think that sums up this review. I hope that you enjoyed and stay tuned every Monday for a new Bionicle fan and review. Let me know down in the comments below, what do you think of this model? Have you tried to build this yourselves? And if so, how do you like the model? Again, special, special thanks to all of the amazing community members who have been generating instructions for these. I've put a link in the description as to where to get these instructions, thanks to a very helpful member on the TTV message boards. I really can't thank you enough because I would not be able to do these reviews without other fans like myself who know how to reverse engineer mocks a lot better than I do, kind of going at it, trying to hone down the most accurate canon representations of these builds. So. Thank you so much for the people who made instructions for these, and again, keep up the great work. I'm so excited to review the rest of the Dark Hunters and Rahi because of people like you making instructions. So, tune in every Monday for a new review, let me know down in the comments below what other models you want to see reviewed, and as usual, stay tuned to Duck Bricks for even more LEGO news, reviews, discussion, and analyses coming your way very soon. Thanks, and bye bye for now.